Thank you. Sarah. Now we're going to hear from Miriam Elman, who will speak on anti-Semitism on the left, the rhetoric and activism of Jewish Voice for Peace. Great. Um, thank you so much, Alvin, and of course, shout out to Bethany for yes. all the work um, you've done uh, to organize this conference. It's been amazing so far. Um, so Alvin wanted me to speak about Jewish Voice for Peace today. Most of you are probably somewhat familiar with this organization, so I wanted to start by sharing an incident that you may not know about, um, and that includes people who think they know a lot about JVP. So I'm going to take you back to November of 2015, and on an evening in November then, about four years ago, Al-Auda, which is the Palestinian Right to Return Coalition, proudly announced on social media platforms that it had co-hosted along with the Cleveland chapter of Jewish Voice for Peace, an event featuring Allison Weir and promoting her work. Now, it's not very surprising that Al-Auda would take the lead in promoting Allison Weir because the two organizations are basically cut from the same cloth. According to the ADL, Al-Auda is a notorious anti-Israel campaigner that views Zionism as, quote, inherently racist and is unwilling to accept Israel's existence. Meanwhile, the ADL has issued a 10-page comprehensive report on Allison Weir. The highlights in that ADL report include her very nasty habit of modernizing anti-Jewish blood libels and characterizing Jews as conspiratorial groups of people who control America and the world. But the fact that JVP's Cleveland chapter hosted an anti-Semitic conspiracist actually tells us a lot more about JVP than it does about Al-Auda. And so my focus of the talk today will be on JVP, and much of my research on left anti-Semitism in recent years has focused on this group. So first, um, this is an example of the kind of function that JVP serves, which is to provide cover as Jews for anti-Semitic allies and partners. JVP operated for about 20 years in relative obscurity, uh, but it catapulted its way in recent years to be a leading player in the U.S. anti-Israel movement precisely because it serves what I call as the Jewish sword and shield of BDS. It uses its position as Jews, which it always says, speak as Jews, to help safeguard BDS from allegations of anti-Semitism and providing it with a veneer of legitimacy. Second, the example of Cleveland's JVP chapter co-hosting Allison Weir highlights the nature of this group as a grassroots movement in which the activism of its local chapters and key activists at the local community, municipal, level matter as much and even more than the work of its executive director, Rebecca Vilcomerson, or others in leadership positions. The example of the Cleveland JVP chapter co-hosting Weir is telling because only a few months before, JVP's official leadership had decided to no longer work with Allison Weir. JVP officially dissociated itself from Weir in a May 2015 letter. It subsequently went, went viral, and then in a publicized statement. And the documents together shed a lot of light on JVP's understanding of anti-Semitism, because in rebuffing Allison Weir, Bill Comerson avoided speaking out directly about her ex-allies Jew-hating rhetoric, even while trying to distance JVP from her. I argued in a couple of blog posts that the decision to cut ties with, Jay, with Allison Weir was a strategic move. It was simply a marketing ploy to protect JVP's brand. JVP was less interested in condemning Weir's obvious anti-Semitism than in protecting JVP's image as a champion of progressive causes and an organization committed to, quote, love justice, and equality for all people. So nowhere in JVP's initial letter to Weir or in its statement 
is we are actually identified as an anti-Semite, which the ADL calls her and flags her as. JVP's beef with Weir was solely associational, that Weir tend to, tends to spend a little too much time giving interviews to neo-Nazi radio programs and to white supremacists. So Weir had basically become a liability and bad for business. Like the BDS movement as a whole, JVP is all about othering and isolating Jews as white, as privileged, as unworthy of the kind of restorative justice that a persecuted minority deserves. And that's why JVP lobbied very heavily against the adoption of IRA uh, and its definition of anti-Semitism. You see on the slide is one of the memes that um, JVP shared um, on social media. But what's really interesting is how many JVP activists at the local level refused to support Volkomerson's decision to break ties with Allison Weir. They actually launched a campaign on Weir's behalf. An open letter was soon posted for signature. It admonished Rebecca Volkomerson for, quote, your recent unfounded attacks on one of the top organizations working in the struggle for Justice for Palestinians and its dedicated leader, Alison Weir. Among the initial signatories of that open letter was none other than JVP activist Hetty Epstein, who is a 91-year-old Holocaust survivor and the founder of JVP's St. Louis branch and a member of the Free Gaza Movement, a radical group that over the years has organized flotillas to directly challenge Israel's siege by initiating confrontations with the IDF and the Navy. The rest of the original signatories to the open letter were all vehemently anti-Israel organizations and campaigners. It was literally a pile-on onto Bill, Com uh, Bill Comerson, who was without a doubt blindsided by it and probably didn't see it coming. But the fact that JVP's non-Jewish allies would turn on it with such vengeance was in fact entirely predictable. JVP, as a self-declared Jewish group, is generally trotted out as being the rare Jews you can trust. Their status is as Jews who criticize other Jews, and that gives them enhanced credibility. But as UC Berkeley's David Schraub noted in a very thoughtful blog post of his own on this incident, JVP's superstanding does not come with any general grant of authority or deference. It is unsurprising that once JVP tried to draw on the credibility they earned as ideological fellow travelers to take a position not favored by their non-Jewish allies to actually call out Allison Weir, they didn't find that the well of goodwill uh, was so strong. It actually, that well went dry. So this example that very few people know about, I bet people who know about JVP may not even know about this, um, it's a mutiny. It was a mutiny in the ranks of JVP, and it tells us a lot because it turns out that for many activists at the local level, Stamping out anti-Semitism matters a lot less than galvanizing our collective political power and protecting the integrity of the larger anti-Israel BDS movement. By my count, some 126 JVP members affiliated with 25 chapters around the country eventually signed the open letter in defense of Allison Weir, many of them in leadership roles in those chapters. And as many of you know, and if you don't, I think you should all read it. Last week, British-based researcher David Collier released a 200-page report on American anti-Israel activist groups who have willingly associated with hardcore anti-Semites both on and offline. And in a few pages of that report, he exposes how JVP activists are still cavorting with Allison Weir online and with other notorious Jewish haters offline. So now you know all about JVP and Allison Weir. Um, but I wanted to just impress upon you that JVP has actually been around a long time. It was founded in 1996 by a small group 
of radicals in the California Bay Area, uh, all Jewish. Um, today, according to its website and recent press releases, it has over 65 member-led chapters across the country and 200,000 online supporters, uh, but looks can be very deceiving, and it's really difficult to pin down these numbers. JVP doesn't provide any evidence for its claim of tens of thousands of Jewish American followers today. It doesn't require that its members be Jewish or even American. Many of its members are not Jewish, including its leading activists. Most of its two dozen affiliated rabbis don't actually lead Jewish congregations. And JVP is notoriously non-transparent about its funding sources, and its website doesn't carry any information about its donors. But we do know because wherever he is, Gerald Steinberg at NGO Monitor, shout out to you, my friend, um, did a wonderful uh, study of JVP uh, sources using um, tax returns, and it turns out that uh, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, uh, not surprisingly, is uh, one of its main benefactors. So um, JVP engages in anti-Semitic forms of anti-Israel expression using uh, the formulation that Ken Walter gave. In its online materials, publications, social media feeds, public speaking events, JVP activists treat Judaism as merely a set of religious and cultural practices, denying that Jews are a people with a history and an ancestral home. JVP is explicitly anti-Zionist. It maintains that Zionism has absolutely no place in America's anti-racist movement because it's, quote, white supremacist ideology that uses the history of Jewish persecution to justify contemporary injustices and state violence. To take one example, JVP's media manager, Naomi Don, argued that white supremacist Richard Spencer, quote, might be right about Israel, end quote, when he drew comparisons between Zionism and his desire for a white ethno-state. Dan's remarks, published in the foreword, by the way, uh, un more on that later, underscore JVP's view of Zionism as a form of white supremacy. In JVP's perspective on the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, Zionism is itself something uniquely detestable, in its rhetoric, Zionism is a morally indefensible project sustained by well-connected and wealthy Jews who use their power to bend Western governments to their will and against their own interests. These are, of course, common anti-Semitic canards and tropes, common in left anti-Semitism, but JVP presents them as anti-racist and as evidence of JVP's own devotion to justice. In staking out this position, JVP's leaders and activists repeatedly insist that anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism, and they situate themselves as victims of baseless charges of anti-Semitism. In this vein, JVP's book on anti-Semitism includes no authors who actually have any expertise on anti-Semitism. Instead, the book gives voice to people like Linda Sarsour and BDS co-founder Omar Barghouti, who both have chapters in the book. It aims to give voice to those who are marginalized by supposedly false allegations of bias. Put all together, JVP works to discredit Jewish concerns about anti-Semitism, casting them instead as a deceitful conspiracy to censor legitimate discourse and debate. It's not merely that Jews are mistaken when they raise the issue of anti-Semitism on the left, or that they're oversensitive to it. They are simply lying, according to JVP. In terms of its activism, JVP works with various marginalized groups. While it relegates Jews to the background of intersectional discourse, it conceptualizes Jews as white, and thus deemed as having no relevant concerns in intersectional spaces. In other words, JVP thinks that Jews need to sit back and listen. JVP presents itself as committed to social justice, to civil liberties, to human rights, to advancing those causes via nonviolence. But the reality is that it promotes and uplifts the killer of Jews stands in solidarity with terrorists like convicted PFLP supermarket bomber 
Rasmia Odeh, who murdered two grad, uh, college students in 1969, and the mass murdering Palestinian terrorist Marwan Barghouti, who's serving multiple life sentences in Israeli prison, and JVP did a online campaign on his behalf. JVP activists are visible presences in many campuses on anti-Israel BDS campaigns in mainline Protestant churches, church assemblies, conventions where anti-Israel resolutions are in play, and in progressive activist circles where Jews who connect and identify with Israel are ostracized, are bullied, are harassed, are defamed. I cannot cover all of these activities. I have very little time, so I just want to highlight a couple things, and I'll go real quick. Back in 2015, I wrote about JVP's St. Louis chapter, who took the side of a Black Lives Matter group that slandered a highly regarded rabbi. She had visited Israel on an APAC-sponsored tour. It was a smear of a BL, of, by a BLM group, but JVP was there to provide the cover. On campuses, JVP defends college professors accused of anti-Semitism, like Joy Correga, and the famous Jaz Barpur, who was mentioned previously by Kerry. JVP has also been promoting anti-Israelism in America's Protestant churches, something it's been doing well over a decade. Its presence in the United Church of Christ conferences since 2015 provides a disturbing example, and I've written quite a bit about that. We can talk about it, if you like, later in the Q&A. JVP's activists operate in multiple arenas to exploit Jewish culture and traditions, including celebrations uh, within the Jewish life cycle. They usurp every single Jewish religious holiday by incorporating anti-Israel themes into them. Traditional anti-Semites over the centuries sought to convert Jews. JVP's anti-Semitism, to the contrary, seeks to convert Judaism to a pro-Palestinian religion of anti-Israelism. And now, there's JVP's deadly exchange, and I'll just end on this point here. This is arguably one of the most vicious campaigns launched by the BDS movement in the United States to date. In the summer of 2017, JVP rolled out this campaign, alleging that the leading organizations of American Jewish life, the ADL, JINSA, the AJC, were deliberately conspiring to harm innocent American people of color by organizing and funding trading programs between the U.S. and Israeli law enforcement. Initially, the campaign focused on blaming Israel using the Ferguson to Palestine meme. But Deadly Exchange also conceives of Israel as a malevolent part of a wider Jewish conspiracy. The campaign alleges that mainstay organizations of American Jewish life are co-conspirators in a nefarious mission to oppress their fellow citizens, including people of color and immigrants. This is a campaign and a claim that is right out of the anti-Semitic forgery the protocols of the elders of Zion. So now JVP is at the forefront of an effort to stoke racial tension and hatred of Jews by portraying Israel and its American supporters as oppressors and even murderers of minorities. JVP isn't merely just condoning or excusing anti-Jewish hatred, but is now disseminating it. So I want to end with just two ways to combat and resist JVP and left anti-Semitism. First, we have to expose JVP's allyships by emphasizing that it does not speak for people of color in America or for other minorities, and that it is hijacking those causes. Recently in Georgia, an organization representing the state's Native Americans released a statement condemning JVP's deadly exchange. I wrote about it recently. We need a lot more of those statements. Second, it should be obvious the American Jewish leadership needs to draw a bright red line at the entrance to the proverbial Jewish big tent and do a much better job of keeping JVP out of it. JVP presents itself as progressive, committed to universal justice. It presents itself often as just anti-Bibi or anti-occupation. It tries to pass as simply anti-occupation. And by doing that, its activists finagle their way into leadership positions on campus, on local synagogues, in federations, in JCRCs. And there they maintain that they speak for the Jewish community. I close by saying that JVP is an extremist hate group 
that enables, legitimizes anti-Semitism by providing a facade and veneer of Jewish legitimacy for the anti-Israel global movement. JVP is not a Jewish group. It normalizes the anti-Israel movement assault on Jewish identity by shielding anti-Zionists and the global BDS movement from accusations of anti-Semitism. More worrisome is JVP is now itself trafficking in anti-Semitic tropes and canards. Its increasingly radical rhetoric and activism on and off campus not only demonstrates a callous disregard for Jewish identity and Jewish life, but has opened up a dangerous space for anti-Semitism among progressives. Thank you very much.